In the last video, we described the central limit theorem. In this video, we will describe how the central limit theorem suggests that Gaussian distributions could be prevalent in physics labs, and how the central limit theorem suggests that slightly disguised Gaussian distributions could also be prevalent in biology. We recall that the central limit theorem states that if one is studying a random variable, itself the sum of a large number of independent random processes, with no small number of these processes dominating the fluctuations of the overall sum, then the random variable of interest can be described by a Gaussian or so-called normal probability distribution. In the cartoons of physical and biological experiments we will now discuss, we will identify sums of large numbers of random variables. One of the most familiar exercises from undergraduate physics labs is the measurement of the period of a pendulum's oscillations. A pendulum swings toward the viewer. The bob then recedes into the page. This back-and-forth motion continues. When asked to measure the period of oscillation, a student may be provided a laser pointer with a photodetector connected to a computer-assisted data acquisition package. The period, which we call here Y, is the duration between every other dip in detected photovoltage. Repeated measurements will reveal that the period varies slightly from oscillation to oscillation. Fluctuations in the period of oscillation result from a combination of sources of noise. Vibrations in the hook supporting the pendulum could result from foot traffic in an upper floor. Let x1 represent the vertical acceleration of the hook. While on average x1 is zero, the hook and ceiling accelerate upward or downward over short intervals of time. We will regard x2 as the velocity of air flowing around the experimental apparatus from nearby vents. Controlled by a thermostat, the airflow can toggle between on and off states, and even a relatively so-called constant state such as on corresponds to fluctuations as a result, for example, of turbulence. Variations in temperature may cause temporary thermal expansion or thermal contraction of the string from which the pendulum bob is suspended. In this illustration, we let x3 represent the temperature of the supporting string. The variable x4 measures the angle through which the pendulum bob is twisted. Imperfections in the bob include dents and bumps. Because the angle x4 varies over time, the bob may present a dent when obstructing the laser beam in one instance, and instead present a protrusion when obstructing the laser beam an oscillatory period afterward. As a consequence, fluctuations in angle x4 contribute to fluctuations in the durations y. In this example, x5 will be an angle representing the directional orientation of the laser pointer. X5 fluctuates owing to unsteady mounting of the laser pointer, and this also contributes fluctuations to the timings of the obstructions of the laser beam incident upon the photodetector. Variables X1 through X5 only begin to represent the many physical processes that one can easily imagine contribute to fluctuations in the measured oscillatory period Y. The deviation of any particular measurement of the period y from its expected value is owing in part to deviation of x1 from its expected value, deviation of x2 from its expected value, owing in part to deviation of x3 from its expected value, and so forth. Many of these sources of noise occur in engineered instruments featuring high quality and high cost. Thus, we argue that these fluctuations may in some sense be small, justifying approximation of delta y by a Taylor expansion truncated after first-order terms. This equation contains products of partial derivatives multiplied against deviations. The partial derivatives parameterize the sensitivity of the period of oscillation to fluctuations in individual physical processes such as hook vibration, airflow, and so forth as we have described. The subscript, capital AVE, stands for average, indicating that we have chosen so-called average conditions as our series expansion point. For a particular measurement in which the deviations delta x1, delta x2, and so forth happen to be zero, 
we expect the deviation to be zero and thus the constant term delta y av must also be zero we relabel the terms in this equation using capital y on the left and capital x1 plus capital x2 and so forth on the right capital x1 is a constant times the deviation delta x1 capital x2 is a constant times the deviation delta x2 and so forth for the situation in which these deviations fluctuate independently the capital x's are an example of a collection of statistically independent random variables capital y could be the sum of a large number of independently fluctuating random variables possibly with no small number of any of these variables dominating the fluctuations of capital y thus with the help of the central limit theorem we conclude that capital y could be gaussian distributed we would expect that many repeated measurements of the oscillation period would fill out a bell-shaped curve using lines of discussion similar to those outlined on this slide we would expect gaussian distributions to characterize the fluctuations of many measurements in experiments in physics labs where large numbers of sources of independent and small fluctuations could be present we have just argued that gaussian distributions may be prevalent in physics labs owing to the presence of large numbers of sources of independent small fluctuations in biological systems fluctuations in chemical reactant abundances inside cells may be large in this case the taylor expansion trick we have just used may be inappropriate nevertheless the central limit theorem may still apply though in a slightly disguised form we now explain why the log normal distribution is sometimes regarded as the default distribution for biological measurements how many copies of protein y are inside a cell the answer varies from cell to cell consider a simple model describing the abundance of protein y in a cell in terms of two reactions in the first reaction reactants x1 x2 and x3 collide with rate coefficient k plus to produce protein y the reaction also involves molecules X4, X5, and other species not listed explicitly. In the second reaction, protein Y degrades with rate coefficient K-. Capital R plus denotes the number of synthesis reactions that have proceeded since a reference time, and capital R minus denotes the number of degradation reactions that have proceeded in the same time interval. The time derivative of the number of proteins Y in a cell is a combined result of synthesis and degradation reactions. The partial change in the number of copies of Y owing to a synthesis event is an increase of 1, that's plus 1. The law of mass action states that the time rate of synthesis reactions is the product of the reactant concentrations X1, X2, X3, and so forth, and the reactant rate coefficient K+. Plus. The partial change in the number of copies of Y owing to a degradation event is a decrease of 1, that's minus 1. The law of mass action states that the time rate of degradation events is a product of all the reactant concentrations, here that's just Y, and the rate coefficient K minus. What is the steady state value of Y? Set the time derivative equal to 0. Move the product k minus y steady state to the left, then divide both sides by k minus. y steady state, uh, yst, equals a product. We see a ratio built from the reaction rate coefficients, and this is multiplied against the product of the reactant concentrations. The transient steady state value of yst in a cell could change over long times because the abundances of the different reactants x1, x2, and so forth vary many biological circuits of research interest are not engineered thus fluctuations in reactant concentrations are not necessarily assured to be small the strategy of using a first order taylor expansion that proved fruitful in the previous discussion of physics labs may be inappropriate for describing fluctuations of a biological origin however we can still recover an equation to which the central limit theorem pertains take the natural log of both sides recall that logarithms convert products into sums move the logarithm of the ratio of rate coefficients to the left and then finally relabel the resulting expression using capital y on the left 
and capital X1 plus capital X2 plus so forth on the right. Consider the situation in which the different reactant species are controlled by separate reactions in separate biological circuits so that their fluctuations are statistically independent. The terms capital X1, capital X2, and so forth then provide an example of a sum over a collection of independently fluctuating random variables. This means that the central limit theorem applies and capital Y is Gaussian distributed. If capital Y is Gaussian distributed, then the natural log of YST is also Gaussian distributed because capital Y and natural log YST are distinguished by only a constant. The single cell levels of the natural log of steady state protein level YST fill out a normal distribution. This particular example has a peak at natural log of YST equals 5 and a standard deviation of 1. Given the distribution for the natural log of YST we have drawn to the left, what is the distribution for YST itself, plotted on a linear scale? Throw down a collection of manipulatives to provide a rough representation of the bell-shaped curve on the left. The three dark blue marbles at the left correspond to the position YST equals e to the 4 in the plot to the right. The five turquoise marbles on the left correspond to the position YST equals e to the 5 equals 150 in the plot to the right. And finally, the three bright marbles on the left correspond to the position YST equals 400 in the plot to the right. The yellow and orange bins are equally wide in the graph to the left. However, the corresponding bins are different widths in the graph to the right. Orange is wider than yellow. Smooth out the distribution to eliminate artifactual gaps. A Gaussian distribution for the natural log of the protein level could very well correspond to a highly skewed distribution for the protein level binned linearly. The distribution on the right is called a log-normal distribution. If a series of single-cell protein level measurements displays a long tail on a linear scale, consider plotting the histogram of the logs of the single-cell protein levels. In some situations, a bell-shaped normal distribution becomes evident. In these cases, it is reasonable to hypothesize that fluctuations in the protein level of interest result from independent fluctuations in a large number of reactant concentrations whose contribution to the steady state level of the protein under scrutiny occurs in the form of a multiplicative product. In this video, we have explained how the central limit theorem can be used to suggest that Gaussian distributions might be prevalent in physics labs. We have also explained how the central limit theorem could be used to suggest that Gaussian distributions could be prevalent in biological systems in a slightly disguised form.